Terps podcast. It's Virginia week, Ahmed. The Terps have the Cavs rolling in Friday night, primetime blackout, black script, Terps uniforms, and a lot of tickets moving for the Terps. But, well, let's stick. Let's start off with what we'll see on the field, then we can talk crowd and all that. Yeah, I think it'll be definitely an exciting game. Obviously, two teams kind of trending in opposite directions right now. UVA coming into College Park looking for their first win. Maryland obviously looking to go 3-0 for the third consecutive season. So uh, definitely a chance for Maryland to kind of close out the non-conference late on a more positive note after the the Charlotte showing, uh, we'd say. So uh, definitely a lots of lots of like on paper. So um, And then uh, obviously a short week going into it. And then Maryland will have uh, an extended week going into their first road game of the Big Ten slate. Yeah, Virginia, tough start to the season. Two really, really good opponents for the Cavs. Uh, they started off against one of the top teams in the country, Tennessee, in what was, I guess, a neutral site game, if you want to. They had Virginia yeah. on one side of the end zone, but they played Tennessee and Nashville, and, well, it was all it was all orange in the stands, and not Virginia orange. That was – I guess they both wear orange, but it was, it was all Tennessee <laughs> ball orange uh, out there. And it, they stuck around in the game for a while. Uh, I, I saw it at the old line tailgate. We had it on. Everybody was kind of interested in what Virginia would be able to do. Obviously, first time back on the field after the tragedy last year for Virginia. But they end up getting rolled in the second half of that one, go down 49-13. And then Saturday, I got a chance to take in most of their game against JMU. It was on ESPNU and two uh, at the same time when the Virginia Tech-Purdue game was in weather delay. And Virginia was rolling. Uh, freshman quarterback pops up, can really throw the ball around. We're going to get a chance to see him in his second game. Uh, of his college career and they hit a weather delay come out of the delay and the Dukes just go on a run crazy run at the end of the game and, and pull out a tight one uh, at Scott Stadium which had a great crowd out there and obviously for Virginia such a meaningful game first time back on the field at home since uh, since what went on last year that ended up taking out the last couple games of their season. Yeah, obviously, like you mentioned, you know, do, do, just a, a tough start to their season. And obviously, in another storyline going into this week, but what happened in week one was uh, in that fourth quarter of that Tennessee loss, uh, uh, Monmouth transfer Tony Musket, uh, he went down with a shoulder injury. So uh, the true freshman, Anthony Calandria, uh, he stepped in and looked a little bit shaky against Tennessee. Obviously, you know, understandable, true freshman going in, uh, obviously in a blowout, but, you know, uh, it's a Big stage for a true freshman, uh, but team defense find his groove a little bit more against JMU in week two. Uh, finished twenty of twenty six for three hundred and seventy seven yards, tossed a pair of touchdowns against one interception. So um, definitely a lot to like. And like we said, going into this week, who starts at quarterback, I think is kind of something to watch. Uh, but I do think that just Maryland, like I said, uh, talent wise and statistically, even Virginia has proven they are uh, among the worst in the ACC, if not the worst right now. Yeah, I think it's a team, you know, week three, 36-35, you know, loss last week against a team that's probably going to either be in the Sunbelt Championship or or get really close preseason pick to at least win their, their half of the Sunbelt Conference, which is really turning into a solid college football conference as far as the lower half of D1 goes. And then obviously a blowout loss to one of the top teams in the country. I think they kind of come into this Maryland game. And from talking to a couple of Virginia fans that I know this last week, they seem to be quite positive, actually, where the program's at. I mean, the preseason predictions we talked about on this show and our season preview was, you know, bottom tier of the ACC, 1-11, 2-10, at best, like 4-8 and eight was thrown out there from many of the writers. I think this Virginia team is going to give Maryland a test, especially if they start off, you know, anywhere close to where they come to Charlotte. If Maryland doesn't come ready to play, I think – Virginia's got some some players, especially in the skill position, a couple of receivers. Their run game's really struggling at the moment, but they can they can come in and and bring some heat and and at least stay in the game for three quarters. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know when you look on the run game on both ends. I mean, like you said, they struggled, but they struggled probably the mo- more one of the worst performances I've seen among any team. Uh, Thirty five carries, eighteen yards, still managed to find three touchdowns in there. Uh, but then again, on the run defense, you know, they struggle uh, mightily there. So I think that's obviously a, a key storyline uh, to, to watch and, and probably a key factor for Maryland if they want to cruise uh, in this game. But um, I do think that, you know, a lot of Virginia fans, there's a reason, you know, when you look at the young, the true freshmen kind of taking that week one, week two jump, um, you know, a lot of the, the Charlotte uh, media has been very bullish on what he's been able to do and, you know, saying, not only does he give Virginia the best chance now, but, you know, is he the, the quarterback of the future? So I think that that obviously I think that uh, 
points to a lot of their optimism there. Um, you mentioned two of those wide receivers, uh, Malachi Fields, Malik Washington. Uh, Malik Washington posted nearly a 200-yard receiving game against JMU. So uh, And uh, Fields as well, hauled in eight receptions. So both of those guys, I think, will probably be Maryland's first test in the secondary. Secondary that, you know, is you know, gone through some some nicks and bruises uh, in this early part of the schedule. So, um, like I said, I, I do think that Maryland, they should be able to kind of take advantage of that. I think, you know, Maryland's offense against that defense, I think, um, you know, the, the run game really should be able to get going. I think the, the, this is a, a chance for Maryland's offensive line to really find their groove. Um, so I think that there is a lot to like in these matchups. And then uh, I think these wide receivers um, have some advantageous matchups uh, as long as Talia can – uh, you know, take take advantage of those deep balls like Loxley has talked about. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. And for JMU in the passing game, they were 20 of 31 for 224. Jordan McLeod's a, a dual threat quarterback uh, for James Madison. He also ran for 32 yards on the day. Virginia, not much pressure on the quarterback. They only record one sack in the game against James Madison. Uh I think for Maryland, this is a real chance to get vertical, to pick up where they left off in the second half of that Charlotte game and come out and really run a good balanced attack of straight at straight at you football where Roman Hemby and Anton Littleton and Colby McDonald can get running downhill. We'll see kind of what the mix of running backs are. I think that's one of the storylines for Maryland in this game. Does Littleton, after being benched uh, after a personal foul, does he did he lose his spot to Colby McDonald, who had a really solid game? Is that turned into more of a you know three-headed monster, which I think what Maryland fans – uh, no, we have with with Colby McDonald really getting his chance to shine. And can they just hit the deep balls on time early in the game? I think if you look at Leah's career, mainly from last year going forward in, in games against worthy competition, they just really haven't been on time at the beginning of the games. They struggled with the deep ball, really hitting guys in stride. I think this is a chance just for Maryland to take what they did in the second half and say, you know, we're here, we fought through adversity, we saw what happened, we were down 14 nothing. we came back. Now let's start fast this week and, and really get out, get on time, and, and run this offense to its full extent. Yeah, I think exactly that. And I think, you know, you mentioned, you know, running back rotation, you know, Colby McDonald. And I think Colby McDonald's looked good. I know I've heard of preseason. He was able to show the flash a little bit. And obviously, Anthony Littleton, um, you know, he, you know, Loxley was kind of asked about it post game, and Loxley made the comment about um, the unsportsmanlike conducts, and you know, I'm tired of the six thumb penalties, and you know, if that's going to happen, then you're going to sit on the bench. Um, so those, you know, I think those things kind of factor in, obviously. But um, you know, I, I think you know, Robin Hemby, obviously, he's going to need to attack. And then you mentioned the passing game. Yeah, I, I expect Maryland to kind of come out firing. Um, obviously, you're looking for seven on every drive, but I think there's going to be a little bit more maybe urgency uh, in that first drive. Um, after, you know, this last week and despite the short week. So I think that's going to be something to watch. And then, you know, on the other side of the ball, I think this is a chance for Maryland, really, you know, UVA, um, they allow the most sacks in the ACC so far through two weeks. Uh, Maryland's defense, you know, I think there's been, you know, quite optimism. I think there's been some some signs early on, but I think you still want to see some, some more pressure inside. And I think this is kind of a chance for Maryland's defensive line to really kind of hit that next stride uh, going into, like I said, you know, with, with – Big Ten play, even though it's Michigan State without a with a suspended Mel Tucker, I guess that's what we're going to call it. Uh, but um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that that's kind of where you know you mentioned you know Tommy A, uh, Jordan Phillips, uh, Tommy A, Kimpy Sote. I think all those guys um, really have a, a field day, and then um, I think that the front seven, obviously, just you I think we've kind of seen the depth of that inside linebacker room. I mean, Jayshon Barham. He's not really playing a ton, and I think you know. I don't think there's much dispute when you say that he's the Maryland's best inside linebacker. But guess what? You how much drop off have you really seen when you know Caleb Wheatley and Fanaji Gote are out on the field? So, um, and that's really not a knock on Barham. It's really more of a testament to just how how good this linebacker room is. So, and and who they're able to turn to. So, um, I'm kind of looking for Maryland's front seven to really dominate this game. Um, you know, it's still a true freshman quarterback. And, you know, yeah, obviously he played J JMU, and I think you know making this JMU offense one-dimensional. And uh, I think that that's kind of the, the big key right there. Yeah, I would say so. And I think you you brought up a great point, which is the eight sacks allowed from this Virginia offensive line to start the season. And it's not like Tennessee sacked them seven times and James Madison got one sack. It was four and four. So they given up four sacks a game but in both. Um, you mentioned it, Tommy A., Jordan Phillips, Trey Colbert, Christian Teague, that interior defensive line rotation, Isaac Bunyan, who, who can actually, I think, might be the best pass um, rusher out of that group right now. 
they got to find a way to get some interior defensive line pressure in this game. It's great that Jay Sean Barham can put up some sacks. It's it's would be nice to see, you know, Quashawn Fuller get back there, yeah. all your edge rushers, Kellen Wyatt, you know, those guys. But really, this interior defensive line's got to show some ability to get some push uh, against in the passing downs and, and really hold their own on this line. Or again, come Big Ten play, we're going to see what we saw last year. Darrell Chami was. Uh, you know, he can get up to the passer. We knew that going into the season. Vindarius Cowan had been able to do that in the past as well. But when it came down to, you know, late season, when there was a lot of tape on Maryland, those guys isolated by the offensive line, doubled, combo blocked, and your interior guys just were not getting pressure or push up the middle. And that's going to create a lot of clean pockets, not a lot of hands in the quarterback's face, not a lot of quarterback hits, even though once in a while they might get a sack. I think that is something definitely to look at against what certainly looks like a subpar offensive line right now. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Obviously, you know, you mentioned and, and you know, um, you know, they, they go against uh, an, an offense that like a Virginia offense that's just really struggled overall. I mean, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it looks like statistically they might be among the worst in the ACC. I mean, right now they sit last in scoring offense, scoring defense, total offense, total defense, run offense and run defense. Uh, and four other, you know, they're one of two teams that are not generating INT right now. I just think, and you mentioned, you know, defensive line, I think Christian Teague is a guy that, you know, I think we, we tend to just kind of look at all the mainly is just the scholarship players, but he's been a guy that, you know, even last year he was able to kind of find his way, you know, even though a small role, I think even through these first two weeks, he's been able to, to kind of factor himself into the rotation. Um, so I think, you know, Maryland will kind of be able to, to need to generate that pressure inside. So I think that'll be a big thing. And then, um, you know, I, I, I just think that, that it'll be really interesting to see how Jake Juan Shepard, Tarheep still, um, you know, how, how the nickel spot kind of aligns, how that kind of adjusts uh, against the CBA front. But uh, again, I, I just think that the biggest thing is, you know, once, once they're kind of able to, to kind of generate that pressure in the front seven um, and, and force Calandria to, to kind of adjust on the fly, roll out of the pocket, it's not his strength. So I, I think that's kind of where Merrill will be able to, to kind of attack them. Yeah, you mentioned the secondary. And my only point on that is I'm, you know, down on the field taking photos of the game and Jaquan Shepard and Tarheep still, and really whoever's playing the nickelback spot are still, and it just might be the coaching Maryland style when it comes to this, very, very contact heavy defensive backs. And when you look at a team right now, that's probably – my prediction is somewhere between – I'm not sure if they're – we're going to talk prop bets later, but if there was one on pass attempts from Virginia, I would put that number probably at like 32, somewhere somewhere over 30, um, just based on where they were successful last week and what they're probably going to look to do. Really interested to see, you know, the way the game's refereed. So far we haven't seen the excessive pass interference calls or, um, you know – contact fouls on the defensive back so that we saw last year from Maryland. And that might be an overall, and it is a step forward for Maryland overall, just step forward and in, in playing clean, not getting personal fouls, not talking to the refs, not getting on the bad side of, of that aspect of, of the game. But if a team really starts to throw the ball, will Maryland get aggressive and will they pick up, you know, three pass interference calls in this game? What will that look like from the kind of revamped or Jaquan Shepard being that new piece to the secondary, he's gotten a couple of those where he's, you know, definitely looked like he could have gotten a flag thrown at him. What do we see when Virginia really tries to spread the ball around and get it out quickly? Yeah, I think that's very fair. And I mean, you know, uh, I think obviously you, you, you've talked about just kind of Jaquan Shepard, how he's going to look. And I, you know, I'll look on a beyond that, you know, a lot was kind of talked about through the off season, you know, um, when they lost, when the cornerback room lost, Deontay Banks and uh, Jaquarian Bennett, you know, they added Jaquan Shepard immediately. And, you know, maybe there was some, you know, some talk that, you know, there was thought possible that they look at another cornerback out of the portal. And, you know, obviously Maryland stood pat there. Um, so we've been able to see Lionel Whitaker, uh, Gavin Gibson. He's, you know, been banged up to start the year. Uh, should be possibly if available, available this weekend. Um, you know, he's been able to go practice last week was, available at practice on Tuesday. Um, so we'll see he's, if he's able to give it a go this week. But, you know, just kind of who's able to kind of emerge beyond him. I think Corey Coley, you know, he's a guy that, you know, again, he's been able to show flashes through these first two weeks. So, again, you, know, you mentioned kind of how the secondary and then it'll be interesting to see how the back line kind of adjusts. Obviously, Dante Trader back there this week. So um, will be uh, will be interesting. But, um, again, I, I do think that just over a 60-minute span, I think, um, you know, I think that – Maryland will be tested. I think it'll be a good, good transition kind of going into, you know, non-conference to big 10, but I just think over a 60 minute stretch, not as strongly as I felt about Charlotte, but I think around over 60 minutes um, wins this game by probably three touchdowns at least. 
Okay, 15 minutes in, we're throwing out score predictions tonight. Um, you mentioned injuries. Where do the Terps kind of sit with the injury report and, and kind of where is Avante Williams at this point? Yeah, I mean, Avante Williams, you know, Loxie talked about it last week. You know, he's a coach's decision or coach's decision not to play week one. Obviously, he was back on the field last week, um, was in pads, going through warm-ups, obviously did not end up playing. Um, so we'll see if he's available. Obviously, he's not on the injury report. So uh, remain to get that coach's decision. And, you know, I mentioned Gavin Gibson, you know, looked like he's kind of inching back as well, able to kind of practice. You know, he's able to give it a go this weekend, you know, whether they, they kind of stay more conservative with the shortened week and, and give it a go for Michigan State. You know, that kind of remains to be seen. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of see on game day uh, for that. Um, obviously, Gottlieb Biedzi, you know, he was back at practice today. Um, Loxley said that he – Expects him to be available to play uh, against Virginia, but he also said the same against Charlotte. So, um, you know, again, Gotti was able to go through warm ups last week and uh, did not was not among, I believe it was eight or nine offensive linemen who played against Charlotte. Um, so we'll see yet see if he's able to kind of rotate in, uh, whether he stays in at right tackle. Um, if Connor Pagan moves out of the rotation completely. Does Maryland adjust? Does a does he, you know, does he line up as a guard at all? And Bagan stays in at right tackle. How much, you know, rotations are in, and you know, kind of experimentation is Maryland still going to do along the offensive line? Um, you know, like I kind of hinted at, you know, just kind of with conference play. So I think those are kind of, you know, some storylines. Obviously, with those injury uh, updates um, kind of going into the week. So, so we'll see. We'll see. I, obviously, Maryland will have a chance to kind of get some keys key pieces back, but uh, I think all eyes will kind of be on uh, Ayedzi kind of with the buzz that he drew kind of going in from the spring to into uh, the fall. I think, you know, he's a big piece that a lot of fans were looking at as a, you know, a starting piece and impact piece uh, at the biggest question mark of the season. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he's able to give it a go Friday night. Yeah. And, and I'm starting to really like the idea of him at guard and, and leaving Connor Fagan in there. I think when you turn on the tape right now, the weak point is the interior line for, Maryland. I don't think Fagan, despite being a walk-on and a lot of people saying, you know, what are they doing with a walk-on in there? I, I kind of like the way he's progressing. I kind of like him in that spot. I think DJ Glaze on the other side is a strong piece for Maryland. It's just, can they work out? One, can we get down to the point where we got one center that we know who's, who's the starter at that spot? I think that is, that's key there. And then for, for almost whatever the reason, the staff is really out on Emilio Moran. I mean, it almost seems like they are not necessarily looking, but from their evaluation, he seems to be the point that they, that piece that they want to move around in there. I mean, I know we've seen a lot of rotation through there, but that center and guard spot that Moran has right now, those clearly are the two spots that they're still trying to figure out a combo they like at. Yeah, and I mean, I think Kyle Long, obviously, he was a guy that was kind of rotating in in the spring as well, and he was, you know, kind of factoring in the rotation. Marcus Dumerville is another guy he's rotated in. Uh, Eric Harris, you know, we kind of talked about in the post-game show, him and uh, Mike Purcell alternating halves there, and Mike Lossie talked about it at the podium, podium today, saying that they kind of, you know, made a change at the center position. Um, so, you know, that'll be kind of interesting to see if, you know, Eric Harris, if he's able to kind of hold on to that spot going into Big Ten play. Um, but... Um, yeah, you know, you mentioned DJ Glaze and Connor Fagan. You know, Connor Fagan, um, he's been a guy that he, he he's not at the top. I believe he was at the top of the snap counts uh, this past week against uh, Charlotte. Um, but again, you know, he's a guy that's been given a lot of opportunity to take over that that spot at right tackle uh, in Eddie's absence. So again, I just think it'll be kind of interesting, and I think. Yeah, you know, again, he's primarily been where I think he's a guy that, um, you know, has the the, the body, the, the the framework and the skill set to possibly be a Big Ten guard. Uh, so I think it'll that'll be kind of interesting. I just don't know. Um, and we'll be really interested to see um, how much rotation they do and especially how much they do um, kind of with a um, with with a Yedzi in his first appearance. Yeah, now let's take a look at, at the spread and some player props. We're going to add a, a little bit of talk about the props that DraftKings has for the game on Friday night. But the big number is the Terps 14.5 point favorite as of right now, which is Tuesday night. And uh, over under set at 49.5. Uh, Ahmed, you already said you like the Terps by three touchdowns. Uh, I'll, I'll have to agree with you there. I would have to play at Maryland, play the 14.5. And, and definitely, I mean, I think the over under is the play, and I, and I like the over. Yeah, I mean, I probably honestly take Maryland minus fourteen and a half, and probably over forty nine and a half. I, I mean, I, I could see Maryland getting to thirty eight, uh, forty one, like 
what didn't completely shock me. And I could see Virginia being able to get a touchdown, possible late field goal, something like that. Um, I don't, I just don't see it being close. But yeah, I mean, I, I like, I like both of those to uh, to cover. Uh, I just think Maryland on paper, like I said, I just think over a sixty minute span, even with Virginia, even though that true freshman quarterback, you know, I think he's been able to kind of show some some strides and some flashes against JMU. I just think, you know, even with a short week, um, I think Maryland will will be able to kind of take advantage. In the running game, they have uh, Roman Hemby over under touchdowns point five. So does Hemby get in the end zone uh, Friday night? Yeah, I mean, they. I, I like Hemby. Um, I, I think that uh, pretty feels like a pretty safe bet uh, for that to hit, uh, especially just kind of we're noting how bad Virginia's run defense has been, kind of going into these you know, week three, obviously. Um, so I, I think this one will hit. And then the receiving yards one, it, it catches my eye as far as it, because Jayshon Jones is the predicted receiving leader for Maryland, 52 and a half yards. His over under followed by Caden Prather at 36 and a half, or Ty Felton actually in front of Prather at 38 and a half, then kind of a mix of Terps, Deitchus at 34 and a half, uh, and Hemby at 17 and a half on there. Jay Sean, the leader, makes sense to me, but Felton as the number two guy, interesting that, that Vegas has kind of has their eyes on Ty Felton. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a guy, you know, um, I think he's a guy that, you know, he's been able to kind of show these splashes, and I think, you know, even with, you know, Caden Prather, Tyrese Chambers, obviously Chambers, um, you know, he wasn't available kind of obviously because he didn't play last week, um, you know, kind of provide an update for him uh, for subscribers over on Inside the Black and Gold. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Felton, he's a guy that will kind of be able to take advantage. And I think he's a guy who's just kind of really developed just in terms of his speed, his route tree. And I think he's a guy, you know, we've seen he's had some opportunities. Obviously, we saw week one he had the big drop uh, that could have been a uh, uh, well, 70, 65-yard touchdown. Um so, yeah, I think, you know, he's a guy who would be kind of interesting. Um, I, I might kind of want to take the over, but I think Deitch's at 34 and a half. That's probably the one that was probably the most attractive to me. Yeah, I mean, a lot of good stuff. A lot of uh, numbers kind of hinting towards maybe Vegas thinking it might be a little bit of a closer game uh, than, than the two of us. But I think the Terps definitely roll in this one. As Ahmed mentioned, make sure to follow our coverage of the game on inside the black and gold post game pod, probably coming to you Saturday morning uh, this week. I will not be at the game uh, on Friday night. So no, no 1130 or 1 AM podcast for those uh, of you that like to watch it right when it comes out this week. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a late one on Saturday. So um, we will definitely adjust to it on, uh, on Friday night. Yeah, it, it was a it was a strange one as well. NBC crew was breaking down. They they actually were nice enough to wait for us to finish uh, the podcast. They 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 held off breaking down their set, but they brought out quite the as many of you saw in the TV broadcast. If you, if you haven't gotten a chance to go back and watch it, it's probably the most prime time set as far as the sky cam and all the different uh, angles that they had of of the game on NBC on Saturday night. They definitely did a really good job covering the game, but. Yeah, they were there, I'm going to guess, well into probably 3, 4 in the morning breaking down that set, but that's that's life in that industry. Um, we'll have the post-game pod here. Make sure to like, subscribe, uh, wherever you get the pod. Leave us a comment. Let us know uh, if you like the par- player prop section or anything else that you want to see on the podcast. For Ahmed, my name is Mason Viner. Uh, and as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.